Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 2021 Esri Developer Summit Virtual Edition again. This is Caching Vector and Raster Tiles Advanced Concepts. My name is Tommy Falvel, and with me today is my very good friend, Grima Tawari. I am a principal technical consultant and cartographer with Esri Professional Services. I've been here for over 15 years, and during that time, I've dedicated myself to the delicate art and sometimes precise science that is base map design and cache generation at both the global and metropolitan area scales and everything in between. Karima? Hello, everyone. My name is Garima Tiwari. I'm a principal product engineer for caching and ArcGIS enterprise development team. Our goal today is to provide you with advanced concepts related to caching and update you with what's new with all things caching within the ArcGIS ecosystem. If you're new to caching, don't worry. Just check out our 2020 and 2019 Dev Summit presentations on caching best practices and basics. Those sessions will reinforce caching concepts for you. Link to those would be in the chat for you. So if you've seen our previous caching best practices sessions, you may remember the caching project framework. We're going to run through each of these sections again in our talk today. But as Grima mentioned, we'll be focusing on more advanced concepts and workflows. And we will be sprinkling a little bit of what's new in as we go. So let's look at our agenda. We will describe the terminology and touch upon the basics. Walk you through the planning, design, and authoring techniques used for caching. List the options available to you for deployment of your cache content. Look at update and automation scripts available to you and addressed common questions related to caching. Caching maps and image content help in providing fast visualization of your map data. Raster tiles are used for maps with vector, raster, or elevation content. These are stored in PNG, JPEG, or LURG format. Vector tiles are used for map with vector content only. The features are stored in protocol buffer format, with its rendering information stored separately from the tiles. These are great for devices with different resolutions and for rendering different styles using a single tile set. Hosted tile layers are called hosted as the content is managed by ArcGIS Enterprise or ArcGIS Online. They are disconnected from source data and cannot support identify and query capabilities. Cache map image layer or cache map service can be published only to ArcGIS server or ArcGIS enterprise. These are connected to the data and are cached on the ArcGIS enterprise. They support identify and query operations. Please see our previous talks to get more details on these. So our goal is to help you get the most out of your caching projects and web enable your data in the most efficient and performant way possible. The key to pulling all of this off is planning. Map design, data viz, cartography, these are all really deep topics. So for the sake of time, we're going to limit our design considerations for cached maps and multi-scale mapping only. The key here I find is asking a lot of questions and getting very specific on what you're trying to do. We want to understand the intent and the audience of our maps and apps. What's their purpose? Who's going to use them? We want to understand what these use cases are and how those maps and apps are going to be used. In what context are they being used? So what questions are my users trying to answer for a specific workflow or aspect of their day? What aren't my users getting from the, their current map or app? Is this going to be a web map or is this a, a map that's going to facilitate a dashboard or should it be used? as a focused app. Perhaps you've got a cool idea for an app with, you know, special functionality that you want to that you want to showcase or that you need to support with your base map project. Do we need to support mobile scenarios? In other words, sometimes connected or completely disconnected scenarios. Do we need to account for third party uh, compatibility? Things like OGC specs or third party APIs uh, that, that are trying to consume our services. Do we need to support mashups or combining our services with other cached base maps? What key business questions need answering or what critical business workflows do we need to support with our map or app? And perhaps most importantly, 
What constraints do we have? A lot of the answers to these questions will bring great clarity to all the constraints and limitations that you have to work within. Things like deadlines, time constraints, infrastructure resources, uh, things like compute or storage. What's our deployment environment look like? Is there a specific version that we have to target? Does that impose any limitations on the functionality that we can employ? All these things should shape, influence, and guide your design. And once you have a handle on these answers, what's next? What's the best way to accomplish that? Again, we're focusing on caching here, and I'm definitely biased, but caching is a great method for web enabling and optimizing your rich content for consumption over the web. So what kind of options do we have? Well, we've got vector tiles or raster tiles. And honestly, from a raster tile perspective, there's really only three types of base map projects that absolutely require raster tiles. That's imagery, elevation in some form, like a hillshade or a hillshade base map, or a 3D terrain image service, what we call a web elevation layer. For all other base map caching projects, you should seriously consider using vector tiles. The time to generate and the storage saving alone make them worth your consideration. To which most folks respond with, well, but my organization still has desktop users and they can't consume vector tiles. Well, that's true. Are they using base maps at all in their day-to-day? -day? If not, is this really a constraint? Again, just something to think about. If you do have folks that are using your organization's base maps, are the things that they're doing in ArcMap something that could be accomplished over the web? Now, if that is a possibility and they can move those workflows over to the web, then vector tiles, I think, are back on the table. Otherwise, sure, you can make your vector base map content available to them as raster tiles. But again, I highly recommend reauthor those maps following the best practices for vector tiles. We've seen solid caching throughput improvement by leveraging those multi-scale mapping principles we talked about in our previous session. Then, when you're done cooking these raster tiles, you can just generate a vector tile base map too. It's a win-win. All right, I think that's enough slides for right now. Let's jump into a demo. There's some new features in the latest release of the Esri JavaScript API version 418 that I'm really excited about. With just a few lines of code, you can build an app that's fast and flexible and let you dynamically restyle a vector tile base map. Some of the new features also open up new ways that you can interact with these maps. Here's a quick example of what I mean. With this app, I can change the language labels to reflect some targeted languages. I can also select the country to highlight. So what did I want to do when I set out to build this app? There are some new bits of technology that I want to demonstrate how to leverage. I want to make a map that can support internationalization or localization. I also want to show users how to leverage the additional attribution coded in the tile set to support filtering of the map layers to highlight or focus on a selected country. I also want to make sure that the app is responsive and works well on either desktop or a mobile device. To accomplish this, we need to create a custom vector tile base map and make sure that that tile set has the required country attribution to enable changing the country labels, as well as support the highlight functionality that we're looking for. We also need to make sure that we select fonts that are appropriate for the various languages that we're going to support. Let me show you how I did that. If you want to take your base map projects to the next level, my number one tip is don't use Web Mercator. We can pull that off in this scenario because we're going with a standalone app and a custom base map. Let's use Equal Earth instead. All right, that's gorgeous. We need to make sure our map is set up to use the scales from our new projection. For this, we're going to cheat and let Pro build out a tiling scheme for us. Did you know when you start the Create Vector Tile Index or the Create Vector Tile Package Tools, Pro will dynamically create a compliant tiling scheme for you based on the coordinate system of your map frame. You only need to specify a map and uncheck 
the box right here. There we go. We'll just grab this path, pop that open inside Notepad++. What we want to do is we want to grab all these scales and put them in a new text file in reverse order. And through the magic of technology, I already have that done. Now back in Pro, come over to Customize, Load, From File, choose that file now. Now all those scales will populate this list. New at Pro 2.7 also, this new feature I love, is the ability to lock zoom scales to the ones in this list. Now when you scroll in or out on the map, it'll snap to these specific scales. This is great for authoring multi-scale maps because it makes navigating exactly to your targeted scales so much easier. This step is also important as it sets up all the UI elements for all the multi-scale mapping features you should be using. So do this first. Scales matter. Making sure layers turn on and off precisely at your tiling scheme scales prevents extraneous data showing up in a level of detail or tile when it's not going to be drawn. That's just a waste of precious payload space. So don't do that. For this map, we also want to make sure that we have a layer that's in our style that we can use as a mask. This will support that highlight feature we were talking about earlier. Now, folks tend to just duplicate layers in your table of contents. This essentially duplicates all the geometry. And for these countries where they're super dense, we don't need to be wasting that much space, especially when we can actually accomplish this task with a single layer in the table of contents. To do that, we're just going to add another symbol layer. So we'll come over here, duplicate, go back to our layers view, select the layer, modify the color, maybe apply a little transparency, and we're done. The next thing we need to do is make sure that we have all of the necessary attributes in this tile set to support dynamic filtering of countries and that critical internationalization localization functionality. So we go to design fields, and we're going to use the highlight functionality. So we're going to place a checkbox in each of the fields that we want to force into the tile set. So we have our English translation, French, Spanish, Russian, Arabic, and Chinese. Now, the cool thing about this data set is that all the translation work has been done for us. This data set comes from GADM.org, and it's been a great resource, and I highly recommend you check that out. So once we place a checkbox in all these, we want to make sure we click Save. Now, that information is stored in this map, and it's specific to this layer. So you could have a different map and a different field selected, and it wouldn't affect us. Additionally, we're not saving anything back to the data set in the database. We want to set up a default label class for the country names and apply some very basic label rules. Don't agonize over this step. Remember, vector tile rendering logic is fairly rudimentary when it comes to label display and deconfliction. Uh, besides, we're going to be making all the fine-tuned style adjustments after we get this base tile set created. So we'll simply choose a typeface and a style. And again, I think this is, this is looking good enough for what we need. Lastly, and here's some post-doctorate level vector tile authoring stuff right here, so, so pay attention. We've got foreign languages that we need to support, and not all typefaces or fonts support all the different glyphs or letters for each of the languages that we're targeting. So what I've done is I've created a new feature class called fonts, it's just a point feature class, and it doesn't have any records in it. It's just completely empty. And I've set up the default symbol properties to disable the symbol. So you just uncheck this box here to turn off that symbol layer. Here's the thing with cooking vector tiles. If a layer isn't symbolized, it doesn't get cooked into the tile set. So if I turned off rivers, rivers wouldn't get cooked into the map. Just because a layer isn't symbolized or isn't visible, if it has a label class, which every layer that gets added to the map has a default label class, that font that's in that default label class is going to get cooked into the tile set. So with that knowledge, I submit to you the Favel font hack. I'm going to create several label classes. For each one, I'm going to pick a different font and style, and then just name it accordingly, just so I know which ones I've included. Now, don't agonize over the name of the label classes. It doesn't affect what goes into the tile set font stack. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm just doing this because I'm neurotic. Now, the name used in the font stack is actually inherited by the font itself. Okay, I think we're finally ready to cook this. So we're going to start with the create vector tile index. We'll let that run. And when that's complete, 
we'll use the create vector tile package tool. One additional tip here is make sure you use the maximum scale in the tiling scheme. So we've got our min scale and scroll all the way down to the bottom and pick that largest scale. And when that's complete, we want to run extract package. And in this case, we want to use the exploded format type. And the reason for that is we actually want to get at the individual protocol buffers. And that's key for the next step. So we'll go to the output directory, browse to the tile directory. We'll grab this path. And we want to use that in this bit of Python, which you can find here on my GitHub page. And we'll run this tool. And this will give us a report on all the different tile sizes that are in there. The largest tile that we've got created is 120.6 kilobytes. And our distribution looks really solid as well, with most of our tiles falling in the 1 to 16 kilobyte range. So that's fantastic. I don't see anything that causes concern here. So let's push this up to my ArcGIS Online account. Grab the vector tile package, add some meaningful tags, and we'll click Add Item. All right, so that's published. Let's open that in a new map. Let's take a look. All right, not too bad. We definitely need to turn off that mask layer. I think I want to change the draw order of the album outlines. Yeah, I think I want them to draw on top of rivers and lakes. So to do this first part with turning this layer, the mask layer off, we're going to use the vector tile style editor for that. I'm not actually editing the hosted tile layer. I'm just editing my copy of it. So I grab that style, I save it to my content, and now I can come in and do whatever I want with it. And in this case, all I want to do is turn off this mask layer. So again, we've got our background fill, we've got our country outlines. The other cool thing is you can come in here and you can see all the fonts that we cooked into the tile set. This is really helpful when it comes to trying to find out the right syntax in your code. That's the actual text string that you want to use in your code later. So we'll come back to that. We'll leave this on the default. Again, we just want to turn this layer off. So we just toggle it on and off, and we'll save that style. So for this last part where I want to change the drawer order of the layers, I'm just going to download this style real quick, pop that open in Notepad++. So we've got our background fill, background polygon for our admin, admin boundaries. We've got that mask layer. There's that gray with the slight transparency. And then we have our admin line or admin strokes. Right? So what we want to do is each of these layers, just individual JSON objects, we want to grab this layer. So we have our rivers layer, and then our lakes layer, and then our label. Right. We want our, our labels to draw on top, so we'll just sneak this new layer in. So our admin line is now going to draw above lakes and above rivers. So with a style file, it's actually in reverse order. So the last thing in your style is the last thing to get drawn. So the bottom thing in this style is what's going to be drawing topmost in your map. Confusing, I know, but just trust me on that one. So I think we've got everything else set. We've got our default visibility for the mask set to none. And we've got our admin line on top of everything else. So we'll give this a save, go back to our web map. We want to go to the item deep details page now for this layer. And this should be the edit layer, right? So we don't see the hosted in parentheses next to it. So this is an editable, not an editable, but an editable um, style at this point. You'll also know that because it's got this awesome update button. So we'll choose file. And we'll update the style file. Let's go in and just confirm that everything's drawn the way we expect. So we'll add that to a new new map. So our mask layer is off and you'll notice now if I flip over to the old one, you can see the lakes are drawing on top of the lines, the country boundaries. Now the country boundaries are drawing properly on top of the water features.
Awesome. So I think that's about it. Uh, this thing's ready to go. So from the item details page, we want to check out the style URL. So I'll just grab that, swing back over to code, paste that in, and off we go. Now all this code is posted up on GitHub at the following URL. It's the IATN VT underscore base map. Fire that up. Again, we can filter. We can change the language. Roll the filter back. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening in the code to make that happen. So we're setting up our selectors, our two little uh, drop-down lists. And the first one we're going to talk about is uh, setting that mask layer. So we're just going to define that layer from our style. And this is refer referring to the uh, layer ID in the style. So we bounce back over to that. We can see the ID for our mask layer is GADM admin zero slash one. Refer to that here. And then essentially what's happening is we're just going to pull that JSON object from the style. And then we do a bunch of logic to, to either um, reset the filter, like with this first step, or actually apply the filter. In other words, we're going to take the country name from the drop down list and say where the attribute name underscore English does not equal that country or France, for example. Essentially, we're going to punch a hole and show everything else. We're going to commit that style. So we're going to cause the map to redraw. But in this case, it's not going to redraw the entire map. It's just going to redraw this mask layer, which is super cool. And then immediately afterwards, we're going to make that layer visible. So we apply this filter, punch the hole in it, and then turn it on. Let's see what that looks like. So we select France. It's taking that country name, inserting in that into the expression, and turning everything else on except for France. Let's go back to code and see how we handle the language bit. What's happening here is we're going to key in on the text field. And essentially with this, this is going to determine what attribute in the tile set inside the admin zero layer is used for labeling. And all we've done is we've just tied that drop down list to a memory object that we created. And so if you select English, we're going to insert this curly braces around name English. This is the syntax that the style is expecting when we're identifying an attribute in the tile set for a specific layer. In other words, this is the name underscore English attribute that we encoded way back in the start of this demo inside ArcGIS Pro. Name underscore Arabic, so on and so forth. So when you select a country, we're just going to marry up that country with the corresponding attribute uh, string. We'll just insert that there. And then we do some additional handling for um, the special cases like Arabic. Now, the other interesting thing about the get style layer method that's new inside the JavaScript API 4.18 release is that we're not just talking get paint properties or get um, get layout properties. We actually have access to both. and we have access to the filter object as well within the, um, within the layer object. So you've got the ability to simultaneously edit all the properties. We can make all these changes to all those, all those different objects, the layout objects, the paint objects, the filter objects. And then when we're all done making those, those, those fine-tuned settings, we commit with the set style layer. And this is going to just redraw the label layer. All the other layers in the map will remain consistent and remain on. I love it. That about wraps this portion of the demo up. Let's, uh, let's check out some raster tiles. What happens when you zoom in on a vector tile base map? It feels like you could zoom forever because of that inherent overzoom functionality. Now, regardless of where you are in your map, you'll always have a map. But with raster tiles, once you hit that last level of detail, your map stops drawing. Thankfully, for a few releases now, ArcGIS Enterprise supported something called tile resampling. Think of resampling as the overzoom for raster tiles. This is what's going to ensure that your map always draws, even if you're zoomed in well beyond past where you generated cache. 
it's also pretty easy to enable. Um, starting at 10.7.1, for any cached map or image service, just add the tile map to the service capabilities, and you're, you're pretty much set. Some time ago on the internet, a very talented cartographer issued a challenge to see what folks could do with some sample terrain data for a geologically fascinating part of the country. I, um, I threw my hat in the ring and, and came up with, with this, which I think is pretty cool, but I wondered what would happen if we tried to get this out on the internet as something beyond just a, a static photo on Instagram or Twitter. What would that take? We've already got a cool map. We want to make sure that it can be combined with other base maps like ArcGIS Online. So that means it's going to be Web Mercator. And since our area of interest is fairly localized, it needs to be in the mixed tile format so that it can be overlaid on top without masking out surrounding areas. I also want this to be publicly accessible. So I think I'm just going to deploy this ArcGIS Online as a tile package and a host a tile layer. So with Pro 2.7, the much-awaited layer blend modes were finally added. Now, these things are cool, but unfortunately, this means that we can't publish the map to ArcGIS Enterprise 10.8.1 because that version of ArcGIS Server wouldn't know what to do with blend modes. At Enterprise 10.9, it'll definitely support blend modes, and you can publish a map image layer that has blend modes enabled, and you can generate cache. That works. But in the meantime... We can still use Pro to cache this, either as a tile package or as a cache data set that we could then use with 10.8.1. So let's take a look at some of the data and how we put this map together. It's two hill shades and a color ramp of the dem. And when you pair that color ramp dem with the overlay blend mode, something interesting happens. That's beautiful. But these lower areas are still a little washed out. So let's check out this second hill shade. With the new luminosity layer blend mode applied to that, it really makes those low-lying areas, really accentuates the, that, that detail that's in there. So it's really cool. So if we use the Create Map Tile Package tool, again, because we want to create a tile package that we can deploy to ArcGIS online, something cool happens. Tile packages, or TPKX specifically, automatically has tile resampling enabled. So we only need to generate cache for this map down to an appropriate level of detail where we max out at the resolution of the, of, of the data. So how do we figure that out? If you right click on any of these layers and you zoom to source resolution, it's gonna land at about one to 4,000. This is a one meter dem. So that's our max scale, that's the max. We don't wanna take it any much further than that. We don't need to. Anything beyond that, it's gonna start looking pixelated and we're generating excessive cache. So if we zoom out, let's see what the minimum is gonna be. So let's see what two million is. That's about postage stamp size. We could even push it to four million. We know our min and our max. We're gonna stick with uh, two million, and four, or I'm sorry, four million and one to 4,000. And so the minimum level of detail is gonna be seven and 17. And we are gonna use the ArcGIS Online because we want, again, we wanna match these up with ArcGIS Online base maps. Uh, because we want to make sure that any map that we combine it with, that we don't lose out on the surrounding areas outside of our area, we're going to use the mixed tiling format with a 75% um, compression quality. We'll specify TPKX, and we hit go. And a short while later, that will create this lovely little tile package. Let's take a look at that. Just double check, make sure it looks all right. Turn these off. There it is. That is really cool. So we've got our gorgeous blend modes forever enshrined inside of a tile package ready for uploading to ArcGIS Online. So we come over to our content section. We'll go to Add Item from my computer. Choose File. Bryce Canyon, we'll add some tags, and we'll add item. Great. So those tiles are now deployed to ArcGIS Online. I'm just waiting for those to finish publishing. Okay, we expand the tile details. We see that all of our cache is deployed. So we're ready to check it out. Let's open this in a new map. Let's check out 
what's happening behind the scenes when you enable tile resampling. So if I open up our developer tools, you just pan and zoom around, get a couple of requests in there. So as we pan and zoom, you're going to start to notice these tile map requests. It actually has this tile map in that request. What this is doing, it's telling the JavaScript API what are the tiles that exist in the next level of detail. So every time that you pan and zoom, it's able to understand based on where cache is generated, when to enable tile resampling. So we keep zooming in, we can keep zooming in all the way down. That is fantastic. So if we open this up, look at those visibility ranges. We are at 1 to 70, even though we only generated cache down to 1 to 4,000. So in summary, when designing and authoring your caching project, remember, it doesn't always have to be Web Mercator. Branch out. There's lots of other, possibly better, options out there. Only add the attributes you absolutely need to support your app requirements and business needs when creating vector tiles. Ratchet tile resampling is like vector tile overzooming. Your map displays no matter what level of detail that you're at. Pro blend modes, the JavaScript API blend modes, for that matter, are going to open up a lot of creative possibilities for your projects. Give them a shot and up your Cardo game. ArcGIS Enterprise and ArcGIS Server isn't always required for every base map project. Pro is nicely positioned to support you in this regard as well. Now let's look at what options you have for cooking. Here is a flowchart that can help you with this decision. Are you going to generate raster or vector tiles? If vector tiles, you can generate it in ArcGIS Pro and publish it as a hosted tile layer in ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise. If raster tiles, are you using Mosaic datasets? If yes, do you have server infrastructure with image server license or extension? If yes, Enterprise is the answer for you. If not, you can still use ArcMap or ArcGIS Pro to generate tile caches. Publish it as a hosted tile layer to ArcGIS Enterprise and ArcGIS Online accounts. If you're creating raster tile content, all the options are available to you. ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS Enterprise and ArcGIS Online. The guiding factors are credits, server resources such as CPU and storage, source data and location, output cache size, and update cycles and timelines for delivery. If you have data that gets updated frequently and you have to generate a lot of content in short duration of time, you should use ArcGIS Enterprise. You should try to keep data locally on each server as much as possible and have a close watch on CPU, memory and I.O. usage while you're generating caches. When using ArcGIS Enterprise, you also have the option to generate caches in cloud and keep your content in object stores in cloud. We provide cloud formation templates for AWS and Azure that can be used to generate large volumes of cache and have a quick turnaround time. Here is a quick overview on how to use CloudFormation templates. Log into your account. In Services, choose CloudFormation. Create stack using new resources. Provide URL to publicly available templates from Esri. Provide name for your template. Choose OS. I have chosen Linux. Provide key pair for accessing the EC2 instances. Choose the ins type of instance you need, the elastic load balancer for the deployment, along with the web adapted names for your portal and server configurations. Once provided, you can review all the parameters you have chosen and acknowledge the terms and conditions. And now you're ready to create your stack. It takes 15 to 20 minutes for the stack to be ready. Once ready, you can access its output to access the portal home page. Now let's look at what we have done to improve the workflows when you're building caches in ArcGIS Pro or ArcMap using packages. 
Publishing hosted tile layers requires uploading of the tile content to ArcGIS Enterprise. This process could become time-consuming and disk resource intensive if you have very large scene or tile packages. We now provide an alternative publishing workflow specifically for those of you who need to publish large pre-cooked tile, vector or scene content to ArcGIS Enterprise. To achieve this in ArcGIS Pro, open Extract Package Geoprocessing Tool. Browse to your pre-existing vector, tile or scene package. For the output folder, you can choose a folder on file system or an object store in cloud such as AWS S3 or Azure Blob Stores. Now enable the option to create ready to serve format and run the tool. For example, here you can see that I have created more than 700 gigabytes worth of scene tile content in AWS S3. I can register this bucket as a user managed data store to my ArcGIS Enterprise account. To do this in ArcGIS Enterprise, go to your portal home application, choose add item as a data store, choose type as cloud store. In the next window, select the provider to be AWS and provide necessary credentials for your bucket. And now federate the data store configuration with your server. Now your user managed data store is ready to be consumed for publishing of scene, tile or vector tile layers. To do this, we have a simple script written, uh, written in ArcGIS API for Python. This will connect to your enterprise publisher account, create scene service configuration using the path to the scene content in the user managed data store and publish more than 700 gigabytes worth of scene content in seconds. ArcGIS Enterprise will serve tile content directly from the registered user managed data store for tile, vector and scene layers. To summarize, these layers are ideal for publishing large volumes of vector, tile and scene content. The tile content is served directly from the file system and object store. It has no restraint on your ArcGIS Enterprise disk or volume resources and supports data resiliency and high availability as configured in the object store. So far we learned how to author, raster and vector content, generate it and deploy it to ArcGIS Enterprise or ArcGIS Online. Our users are able to access these services. The next step is to make sure the cache content for these services is current and updated regularly. For hosted tile layers, we recommend using Replace Web Layer Geoprocessing Tool. You can run this using ArcPy scripts or you can utilize ArcGIS API for Python to publish a vector tile package with new content and replace a production layer using its updated content. For cache map image layer, you can always script using Manage Map Server cache tiles in ArcPy. Now let's look at something new that's coming in ArcGIS Enterprise 10.9 that will help you even more. For caching maps with vector content, we recommend using vector tiles. As vector tile layers support great visualization in different devices, a single tile set can be rendered in different styles, and these are lightweight and have fast cache generation times unlike raster tiles. However, Vector tile package based tile layers are disconnected with source data. Anytime the source data is updated, you need to recreate the vector tile packages in ArcGIS Pro to get updated vector tile layer content. At ArcGIS Enterprise 10.9, we now support vector tile layers that are connected to source data via a coupled feature layer. This provides you the ability to rebuild your vector tiles in ArcGIS Enterprise. The coupled feature service provides query, identify, and legends capabilities along with the editing capability. You can publish these using the new publishing experience in ArcGIS Pro 2.8. Create your map content and use the Share as UI. You now have the option to publish vector tile layers by reference 
or by copying data with coupled feature services. When choosing copy data option, you can choose to copy map content to relational data store using hosted feature service. You have the option to build vector cache on the server or locally in an ArcGIS Pro. Or you can publish vector tile layers by reference to content in SDE, register to your enterprise. You can configure the coupled feature service configuration using the UI. Here, I would select the appropriate tiling scheme for my vector tile layer and publish the vector tile to my ArcGIS Enterprise. The data is copied to ArcGIS Enterprise and the cache generation of the vector tile layers is done in ArcGIS Enterprise. Once the cache has been generated, your vector tile layer would be ready to be consumed in your client applications. Whenever the source content is edited using SDE or associated feature layer, you can update your vector tile content in ArcGIS Enterprise. To achieve this, in your portal home app, go to the Vector Tile Layer item and open its Settings tab. At the bottom of the Settings tabs, use the Rebuild Cache button to submit a update cache job on your vector tile layer item. The cache content is created in a temporary folder. Once the cache job is completed successfully, the production cache would be updated with the new content, giving you a minimal downtime for your production vector tile layer services. To summarize, ArcGIS 10.9 supports vector tile layers connected to source data. Users can edit content using feature layers or SDE connections. The vector tile content can be rebuilt in ArcGIS Enterprise. These vector tile layers are ideal for vector content that gets updated regularly. You can create web applications to fulfill query identify using the coupled feature layers associated with this vector tile service. So let's look at some common questions that we get for caching. Do I need the tile cache data store for my hosted tile layers? ArcGIS Data Store Tile Cache Store is used for scene caches only. You do not need to install this product if you only have raster or vector tiles. Vector tiles are stored in ArcGIS Enterprise Hosting Server's cache directory. Raster tiles can be stored on either hosting server's cache directory or on federated server's cache directory. But none of this content is stored in the tile cache data store. Most common question that we get for imagery users is that I get a checkerboard pattern and some non-pixel areas in my imagery base map cache. Tommy, your thoughts on that? So this is usually tied to um, a very simple fix. There are a few settings in the mosaic data set properties that you want to look at. If you're seeing these areas where it doesn't feel like the base map finished drawing, all right, it's um, just sort of missing areas from our base map cache, and they are in a re they're going to be in a regular pattern. They'll usually be in the, the southeast portion of a uh, what we refer to as a super tile. So along a tile grid, you'll notice these things popping, uh, populating, almost looks like a Tetris piece. This is because the number of rows and columns that were in that base map or in that, that cache request to generate the cache violated the, uh, the maximum number of rows and columns property in the Mosaic data set. So increasing that to a pretty crazy number like 5 million like I have here will fix that problem. Um, also, while you're in there, make sure you increase the maximum number of rasters per mosaic. Uh, as well. Make that at least as many number of records there are on the Mosaic data set just to um, rule out any possibility of, of limitations of the Mosaic data set level getting in the way of drawing that image. If this is published, you may need to republish this image service. Otherwise, uh, refresh your image service re and update your base map cache just in the areas that need to be updated. So the other common problem that we also see here with imagery is um, something happened with uh, the paths to our mosaic data set. Either the, um, 
the 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 path changed or we had some other uh some other issue uh, cropped up with that again another fairly simple fix here double check the paths that are in the mosaic data set just use the repair mosaic data set paths geoprocessing tool if those paths look good it could also be tied to the arcgis server service account not having appropriate access anymore things happen sometimes permissions get rolled back just confirm that your service account has access to it and you should be all set. My web browser crashes whenever I load my vector tile layer base map. What could be going wrong? So another fairly common uh, question. Uh, we make it very easy to create vector tiles with RTS Pro. Um, but what sometimes happens is, is that we make an inefficient base map as a result. Usually when a browser crashes, it's tied to one of two things, either an outdated graphics card driver, but more than likely it's caused by your vector tiles being too big. When this happens, you need to narrow down the issue to which layers are causing the problems with the QC tools that we mentioned at the end of our Dev Summit talk from last year. Once you figure out the regions or data layers that are suspect, uh, you can confirm that you've got solid geometry by running check geometry on those layers perhaps even run some more aggressive generalization passes on those specific layers to reduce the density um, of those features. If that still doesn't get your payloads under control and you're still crashing the web browser, you may need to adjust the cartography and push or reserve those really detailed features for the largest scales of your map. Uh, in other words, when you're further zoomed in, uh, regenerate your base map cache and, and validate and make sure that your, your payload sizes aren't in the, again, we usually say if each individual tile is under 150 kilobytes, that's around a safe comparable to a, a large JPEG. Anything bigger than that, it's going to start to um, degrade performance and perception of performance of your base map. It'll just feel very sluggish and very heavy. One of the other very common questions that I get when um, working with customers uh, about how to optimize caching in, in, in their specific environments is, I don't have a development environment or a staging environment. My production environment is all I have. Um, is it possible for me to generate cache in my production environment? So our recommendation to you is that whenever you're generating caches in your production environment, do it with caution. Do it during downtime hours. Ensure you leave enough system resources to meet your business needs. Reduce the number of instances for caching geoprocessing service. Caching isn't gentle. If you configure the caching instances to consume all the available CPUs on your ArcGIS server, it will use them. So reduce the number of instances for caching geoprocessing service. The other option that is available to you is to generate caches in desktop clients such as ArcGIS Pro. All right, so that's it. Uh, I think we're going to wrap it up and open up the uh, live Q&A. So we'll talk to you in a moment. Thanks for, uh, thanks for sitting through that. Please make sure to fill out the session uh, survey at the end. There should be a link below the video. And uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks again.